This meeting is being recorded. Good to go whenever you are. Great. Thank you, Vicky. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this session of Blades Week at the Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. We have the honor to do the last of the five sessions today, which will be on manufacturing and supply chain. And I'll be joined by uh, three excellent panelists that have a background in uh, manufacturing and in helping companies in the supply chain uh, for offshore wind and also other energy uh, related uh, companies today. Uh, we will be talking about how the UK can maximize the opportunities uh, within offshore wind uh, blades market. Um, so my name is Christina Garcia Duffy. I'm technical director here for the Catapult, and I joined just three months ago uh, from the aerospace uh, sector. So I'm new to the sector, not unfamiliar with blades. I come from a helicopter rotorcraft background originally in my career, so I know a little bit of rotating airfoils. Uh, so let me go through a few slides and introduce the session, and then we'll let the panelists uh, give their views on the different topics. Going to here, so if you have had the pleasure of joining us throughout the week, uh, we have had five sessions sort of at lunchtime every day. Uh, we started on Monday with uh, outlining the design challenges and choices for blades in the industry. Uh, on Tuesday, we had a look at composites in uh, the supply chain, focusing on blades and also uh, touched upon some other opportunities for composites, majoritarily in wind turbines. Uh, Wednesday, we had a session on disruptive innovation and looked at some of the uh, new emerging technologies and capabilities in the area of blade maintenance. And lastly, yesterday, we talked about sustainability, circularity, blades. How do we uh, recycle those blades? How can we dispose of them in a more sustainable way? And that brings us to today, where we will be talking about uh, manufacturing in general and uh, the opportunities for the supply chain in the UK particularly. So let me introduce the topics for the day. Um, I've already introduced myself and I'll give you a very brief overview of some of the activities we are leading on within the catapult. And then we have speeches from uh, three different experts in the field. Uh, we will start uh, with a, a discussion on uh, outstanding successes and an explanation on what a good supply chain company looks like in the arena of uh, offshore wind. And that will be introduced by uh, Sarah Miller from uh, EC20. She's a supply chain specialist. Uh, Sarah, would you like to say hello to the audience? Of course, yeah. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us on a Friday afternoon. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, we will then follow on with an overview of another uh, steel and fabrication sector and some key uh, advice on companies who may want to break into the uh, wind energy sector. And for that, we will have uh, Steve Chisholm uh, give us an overview of that. Steve, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Yes, thanks, Christina. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, I'm Steve Chisholm, the Operations Innovation Director with Global Energy Group, and uh, look forward to speaking to you later. Thanks. 
That's great. Thank you, Steve. And last but not least, uh, we will have an overview from an expert in uh, roto in, in wind blade manufacturing uh, with a, an outstanding background from from Vestas and others. Um, we have a uh, John Rimmer. John, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? Uh, good afternoon. Hi, I'm John Rimmer. Yeah, I work for, I set up a company called uh, DuraWind um, and previously had spent 25 years or so working with OEMs, um, mainly Vestas. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, John. Uh, we'll have an opportunity for a question and answer session from the audience. So if you have any burning questions during the presentations, please post them in the Q&A box that you can find in the Zoom interface. And we'll aim uh, to answer all of the questions as they come in. I may do some packaging of them, but please do answer the questions at any time and we will review them at, uh, towards the end of the session. Uh, so without further ado, let me give you an update on uh, the status of manufacturing and supply chain challenges in the UK and the opportunities that may lie ahead uh, for uh, all of us in the near future. Uh, so just to give you an overview, and I'm sure most of you are familiar, the uh, offshore wind market is massively expanding globally. Uh, we have a cumulative market value just for the blades globally that will soar from about 17 billion by the year 2030, that is eight years from now. And our internal forecasting team um, expect that that market is going to grow exponentially up to about 82 billion pounds worth by the year 2050, if we are to meet our um, net zero commitments in the UK and other decarbonisation commitments worldwide to decarbonise energy. What that means in the UK is uh, for us in the leading up to 2030, we will have to um, deliver a programme of work on blades worth about 1.7 billion now, growing to 8.5 billion by, by that 2050 time frame. There's, of course, great local uh, opportunities in the UK with all of the rounds being announced and all of the uh, large amounts of gigawatt of energy that we're going to uh, have to deliver in the next few years and decades and also massive export opportunities. We are a great manufacturing nation and we should exploit those opportunities in the export markets going forward. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those opportunities today. Um, in the nearer term, if I put it into context for Blades, to deliver our ambitions by 2050, that means we need to manufacture about five gigawatt worth of uh, equipment per year, which means three blades per day or about a thousand blades per year so that we have the installed capacity to meet those targets that have been set by government. So you can see that the opportunities are limitless really in this arena for UK suppliers to, to help make that happen. If I talk a little bit more about our uh, manufacturing activities within the Catapult Center, uh, we have work packages and uh, various pieces of work ongoing. And I'm just going to mention a few of them to give you a flavor of what we do. Uh, we have a phase two of a, of a program called Jewel. And if you joined us earlier in the week, uh, we had quite an extensive overview of the Jewel program. This is a collaboration between 
the ORE catapult and the National Composite Center. It is a five million program which is funded by BASE, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy. And it is phase two. We had a feasibility study during phase one and now phase two is looking at design methodologies for uh, blades and how we can incorporate more composite materials, more automation, better manufacturing processes for blades and also other components. And as the test bed for it, we're using a, a fully newly designed 20 megawatt floating wind turbine of the future and testing and parameterizing the technologies against uh, that technology standard, that wind turbine standard. Uh, so that's going well. And again, if you want more details on the program, please go to the YouTube channel and look at those presentations. They're all on our YouTube channel. The second activity I wanted to highlight is on the circularity side of things and sustainability. Uh, we are delivery partners on Silswind, which again is led by the National Composite Centre, and that's looking at circularity of blades, recycling, end of life, disassembly techniques, and full life cycle assessment uh, for those. It's a collaboration amongst uh, different partners, and you can also find some details on our website if you'd like to, to see more. Uh, lastly, we are uh, testing, we are developing manufacturing techniques with partners, and I wanted to highlight one of our latest additions to the catapult, uh, which is a state-of-the-art uh, prototype blade manufacturing facility, which uses additive manufacturing robots. And that will help us realize the designs that uh, we, we come up with for different uh, components in blades and uh, actually build them, manufacture them, test them uh, to ensure that uh, they are not only designable, they're also manufacturable. So that gives you a bit of an overview. Uh, manufacturing is an area that we see increasing in the catapult, especially with our partners in the high value manufacturing catapult and others going forward, especially if the demonstrators within uh, Joule that we design can then be deployed to the supply chain to be manufactured and perfected through, um, through later stages of the, the design process. The other area I wanted to highlight, you may have heard during the week some of these initiatives, is our catapult support to the supply chain. Now, this is wider than in blades and in blades manufacturing. Uh, some of these companies, however, do have the potential to move into this area. And I'll just mention a few. We have the Offshore Wind Growth Partnership, which is an instrument uh, helping the supply chain uh, come into the wind sector or establish themselves in different areas within a wind sector services, products, technology development. Uh, we also have FIT for offshore renewables, and I believe Sarah may be talking a little bit more about that and some, some examples of companies that have gone through that process. Uh, we have the TIGOR uh, program as well in the northeast of England, very much helping the supply chain. And I believe there's a call open now and manufacturing may very well be, um, blade manufacturing may very well be a topic that uh, some of the supply chain companies uh, want to pursue and apply for through this program. And then we have an accelerator program where we provide 
uh, not only support on the technology development side of things, also as a company, some training and, and linking with companies opportunities through an accelerator program called the Launch Academy, which is regional and has been launched around the country really. Now we have a few, uh, a few versions of it across the UK. Uh, so that's how we help the supply chain and within that we're very much interested in companies wanted to break into this uh, blades area manufacturing and design of blade components uh, for the UK. So with that I'd like to uh, stop sharing my screen and I'd like to introduce our first speaker, uh, which is Sarah Miller. Uh, Sarah is the supply chain specialist within EC20. Uh, she began her journey into offshore wind back in 2009, and uh, she has witnessed the industry change from a concept to a viable commercial opportunity. Uh, she has led uh, LCOE drop from, she has seen it drop from 150 pounds per megawatt hour down to about 39 pounds in uh, AR3, the, the latest round. Through this journey, there is no doubt that the supply chain has grown significantly from the incredible development of larger turbines at the front end through to smaller and more efficient monitoring systems at the operational end. And it is her passion to help companies achieve success within our industry. Over the years, Sarah has developed a wealth of experience in assisting companies of all sizes realize and surpass their new energy goals, achieving that just transition and cementing themselves in the energy industry for years to come. It is said that Sarah loves to talk, prides herself on her openness and ability to ask what may sometimes seem like the silly questions, which are usually the ones you've heard in everybody's lips. Uh, Sarah is also a strong advocate for workplace equality and through the EC20 affiliated Full Circle 21, hopes to be part of the shift. I welcome Sarah. Thank you very much for joining us and look forward to your presentation. Thank you very much, Christina. Sorry for the long winded introduction, but let's move on back to the subject. So first of all, I'll just check everyone can see my screen just fine. Um, it's great. Thank you for the wonderful introduction, Christina. It's just mind boggling figures, the, the sums of what we have to do in the next 10 to 15 years is, is quite incredible. And it's thanks to industry bodies such as the Worry Catapult that we have the, this uh, space where we can realize active col collaboration and really um, produce some real innovation. So moving on, my name is Sarah Miller. I'm here representing EC20 Limited and my job today is to guide you through our experiences so far within offshore wind energy transition zone and, and what we really feel drives success. So first, just a bit about EC20. I'll keep it very brief. If I can get the slide to shift on, that would be great. Um, our primary focus is offshore renewables here in the UK. So um, assisting the public sector in delivering the offshore wind message as clearly as possible. We guide so many companies through their own energy transition. So we, we do everything down to getting them strategizing, really just making them think and feel that they both know offshore wind themselves, but also can offshore wind. And then we move on to the tier one contractors and we help them to achieve 
as ambitious as possible goals and aspirations for their own supply chain plans. And then basically it's just acting as a muster point right in the centre for all things supply chain, ensuring that every company we work with, um, whether they're a small growing outfit or a tier one contractor, um, achieve what they set out to achieve and we'll do everything in our possible power to broaden their aspirations. So in our journey so far, we've helped quite a number of companies. This is just a, a, a little cross section of um, the companies that we've helped, uh, some of them through the likes of the Fit4 campaign, some of them independently, and then some of them through Scotland, um, which is our most recent thing that's burned on our eyeballs. So for a bit of context here, we've got the smallest of the small, we've got some rope access companies, some companies with unique technologies, and then we go straight up to the likes of Ridge, Fanard, Deep Ocean, pe people with real assets and real oomph. So, but what we find a lot of the time, a lot of the companies we help are are transitioning from um, another industry. So it could have been uh, offshore oil and gas, it can be construction, it could be like Christina, aerospace. And a lot of them, they have uniqueness, they have a, a place in the market, but the key questions on the lips of them is like the likes of where do we start off? When is the right time to enter the market? when will work, the workflow be steady enough to give us a solid order backlog? Is the market ready for this product or is the competition too fierce? So like I say, mainly these companies that we work with come from quite a heavy industry backgrounds, but they all have transferable skills, whether that be within engineering, marine coordination, asset access, AI technologies, they clearly see where they fit. Um, and it's our job then to bring them in to the offshore wind area. So three kind of, uh, what we, we find that determines success is kind of threefold. And this is a little overview of in what we believe are good character traits for a successful outcome. So the first being self-belief, and these companies are tend to have a strong brand identity with a leading edge over their competitive products in the market that they're in today. So the, they would be market leaders, for example, within their current sector, and, and, that, and that then translates successfully over into offshore wind. The next subheader there is hardworking. So these companies tend to have quite an extensive manpower behind their drive into offshore wind and that is then they're able to then dedicate their time to learning and modifying what their product range is currently capable of to match what it is required of the offshore wind industry so whether that be a dedicated business development team or indeed a, a strategic R&D department they basically they have the staff pool, the staff pool capable of undertaking the huge task, which is new market entry. The last subheading there is collaborative thinkers. So these are the companies that know their products fit, but maybe know that they're a crucial cog in a very large wheel, or perhaps they can absorb other services into their own offering to broaden themselves and and obviously they're the collaboration party parties so these are the people who then go out to the market but they don't only make connections with their prospective customers but they also do so within the supply chain and and what they do in that sense is they try and make that slightly ill-fitting round peg fit the square hole which is offshore wind so to flip the, these thoughts on their head a little bit, when, it, when we've talked to a lot of developers and, and through the research that we've, we've collated, 
um, we find that there's there is lots of collaborative shaped holes throughout the supply chain, but specifically within blades and the wider O&M world. And that comes in the form of, of data, really, is, is what, what it comes down to. So historically, so much data has been collected, but maybe not compared. Therefore, there's, there's so much intelligence that's yet to be gained. And I know that this, this is a very rapidly growing and changing environment with the inception of things such as digital twinning and other disruptive technologies. So now it's our job to embrace that progression and fill those square shaped holes. And a company that we are working with currently is, is called Ventus. Um, I would really love to highlight this company to you guys. I, I feel like what they do is, is highly relevant to this, um, to this topic. So they're currently, they're HQ'd out of Vienna and Austria, but they do have offices in Denmark and here in the UK in Edinburgh, Poland and, and India. And they've developed a, a highly intelligent turbine optimization technology designed to ensure that each blade on each turbine and thus each wind farm is performing to its absolute maximum potential throughout its life cycle. So their clever use of hardware from a, the, the nacelle-based LiDAR technology. It's also through um, high-resolution cameras placed on drones. So they collate all that hard data and they feed it into their artificial intelligence-driven software. And that identifies cracks millimeters in length and also blade misalignments and any other criteria which could explain an under underperforming turbine. So, and then the next step of their process is ongoing maintenance. And, and they do that through the installation of in blade sensors, which then monitor the blade performance and the blade condition going forward, thus ensuring that each individual asset enjoys a long and fruitful career. So that's just one example of many that we've no doubt heard already from this week. And we, we just need to share in that mindset of collaboration and innovative thinking. So I'm, I'm hoping that many of you listening here today have very similar ideas uh, and, and things that you can share with the industry. And, and basically all that's required is to channel those thoughts in the right way. So there's fabulous schemes already uh, in place through the Catapult, such as Fit for Offshore Renewables that we're sales and EC20 work for. We're, to give you a brief update on Fit for offer, Offshore Renewables, we're currently entering the second cohort here in the Northeast of Scotland. So we'll be helping the, the second bunch now get achieve their um, their market excellence qualifications, which will go alongside their business excellence. So overall, at the end of that process, what you, sh you should have is a sound understanding of the industry, as well as a sound understanding of what you can do within that industry. Another programme we help with is the Waste programme, which is a, a, a spin-off spin from the Offshore Wind Growth Partnership. And again, that's just about identifying and strategising with an individual company to ensure that they are on the right road to success. Because we're not going to do it alone, we need to do it as a combined effort to ensure that our supply chain is the best in the world here in the UK. So that's me. Thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to the panel session at the end. And of course, please reach out to me if you feel that your company just needs a little bit of guidance. Um, we are very much here to help. I'll hand back to Christina. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, great to see what good character traits make for successful businesses. And I particularly enjoyed your example of a, you know, a successful uh, business such as, as Ventus. Thank you very much for your insights. Looking forward to those questions. Our next panelist is Steve Chisholm. And Steve has been, uh, he's currently the Director of Operations and Innovation within the Renewables and Energy Transition Team 
at Global Energy Group. Uh, he has been with Global Energy Group for 11 years. Uh, Steve has over 35 years operational experience in the renewables, upstream oil and gas, and nuclear energy industries. Uh, his career includes non-executive and executive boards, uh, roles at board level uh, within a variety of organizations, both in the public and non-for-profit sector and in the, um, in the private sector. Uh, for 15 years of his career, he managed companies involved in driving innovation, including some world first developments at the cutting edge of welding and materials technology, and he has co-authored a number of international patents within this sector. He's now bringing in his knowledge into the renewable sector to improve our manufacturing competitiveness. Welcome, welcome, Steve. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Christina. Hopefully, you can all see me now. Yeah, there's absolutely nothing worse than listening to your own bio. But uh, you know, um, <laughs> th thanks, everyone. Uh, so I'm I'm speaking today. I, we we work out of an office mainly in Edinburgh City Centre, at the heart of where many of the developers and the financial communities base. But uh, today I'm I'm coming from Neg Energy Park, which is the image you should be seeing in your screens. And what you're looking at there are the uh, foundation foundation jackets for SAC and their partners. Sea Green Development, which is Scotland's largest and the world's deepest uh, fixed offshore wind uh, development to date. Uh, and uh, as Global Energy Group, we uh, have long been a fabricator and port operator in oil and gas. And over the last few years, since 2004, we've transitioned into renewables with work in wave, tidal, and increasingly more and more uh, offshore wind. And looking forward to Scotland ahead, where we've got you know, a very large build out of, of floating and fixed winds projects uh, in the late 20s through into the into the 30s. So uh, I know nothing about blades uh, other than that we we see a lot of them on site and we've got a lot of them here today in the background of the of the image just out of shot at the moment. But um, what we have been asked to speak about just our journey uh, moving into renewables and, and into manufacturing and to share some of the, the sort of challenges we faced along the way and, and hopefully these will resonate with people listening and again like Sarah really looking forward to the kind of Q&A that comes to the end so I guess the biggest impact and thing that hit us was in oil and gas you, you tend to make bespoke projects we're maybe making one of something or two of something they may be very large they may be very expensive sometimes worth tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars but um, you do them once as a project and then you're done. And the benefit of that is, you know, you know what you're doing, it's familiar. If you get your tender wrong or there's something goes untoward during the project, the impact is typically contained and fixed within that, that project or contract scope. But in the world of renewables, when you're looking at an example like on the screen at the moment, if you get the price of making that jacket or doing working it wrong, you have to sit and suffer and uh, suffer patiently watching that problem repeat itself for every one of the 80, 100 or whatever more that you're actually manufacturing. So you have to get it right. You have to be very precise in, in what you're taking on, understanding the technical risks and the and the commercial risks, because serial production is, is very different. Mm -hmm. uh, we've also found that it's pretty commoditized as well and, and very competitive. So whilst, as Sarah said, we've seen the levelized cost of energy and the, the cost, the strike price coming down from 150 pounds a megawatt hour down to the 40s, uh, that's come with pressure on the supply chain. And it's come at a time when the supply chain is probably not ready and not mature and not fully established to deliver what industry wants. So it's a real challenge to try and develop new skills, new capacity, new capability, at the same time, the market's already taken the price down to an ultra competitive point. So it necessitates really a change in thinking. You need a lot of production planning skills and expertise that you previously maybe didn't have to deploy. The urgency and the necessity of getting it right first time of operating in a lean environment, deploying lean management skills are absolutely key. And whilst the supply chain is well established and mature in oil and gas, we typically major projects thought historically, but just, well, 
we've got a list of materials to buy and a material takeoff. We just go out and we buy stuff. But in the world of renewables at scale with cereal production, it's about developing long-term close relationships with key partners in the supply chain, making sure that they themselves are ultra competitive because it really is a, a, a case where fractions of a percent of efficiency gain or cost reduction can make a big difference over the piece. So what we found is that the, the corporate culture, the commercial awareness that you need this approach towards right first time and, and lean management uh, is very much a different culture to what we might have seen in oil and gas and energy before now. And it's difficult to, to mix the two. So we've looked at two ways using integrated teams and the same facilities for doing both markets, the oil and gas and traditional energy market and the newer markets for say offshore wind and hydrogen and other things. And we found that they, they don't sit together too well as good bedfellows and increasingly going forward, we're, we're looking to, to split those apart. Um, manufacturing as well, we've looked at how do you make ourselves you know, more competitive. And again, we really can't compete with the lower labor costs of, of working overseas. Uh, directly. So we believe, and it seems to be a view shared by others as well in the sector, that we can only really compete by being more innovative, deploying more disruptive technologies and collaborating better with each other in the supply chain than perhaps some of our overseas competitors can do. So over the years as a company, we didn't really invest heavily in R&D, whereas now we have a significant portfolio of projects from and everything from electron beam welding the use of artificial intelligence and machine learning to deploy robots that can emulate a, a human's welding dexterity to digital twinning and modeling so that we can really simulate very complex fabrications and assemblies and work out the absolutely best and most efficient way of doing them, whereas before we might have just deployed more kind of common techniques. So I think from that side of, of things, uh, you know, the, the impact that you might have to have if you're a a new entrant are looking to pivot from traditional energy or oil and gas into this is, is, is key. You need to really think about being ultra competitive. It's all about incremental gains, good planning. And so much of the skills that we've been learning, we've been fortunate enough to have a lot of support from offshore wind growth partnership. And I won't repeat some of the schemes that, that Sarah's mentioned, but one of the ones that we've been in for a year now is a scheme uh, managed by uh, offshore wind growth partnership and the catapult, which is sharing and growth. And that was a very successful program in aerospace. And it's very much allowing companies to strengthen their overall performance, but with a particular focus on, on competitive manufacturing at scale and also the management of the supply chains within that. So lots of transferable skills. And two years ago, if you'd said to me, I'd be visiting car plants and aerospace plants, I'd be speaking to technologists from those industries, um, and even out speaking to Disney in Paris, and, and you think, well, what is, what is Disney to do with uh, manufacturing and renewables? Well, again, what we found when we go and try and recruit people, and we train them, and, and we try and have a culture of high performance and going the extra mile, actually Disney emerges as one of the most successful companies in the world, and getting that can-do and competitive culture and service culture into its workforce. So what we found is that we really need to look outside our own envelope and our own traditional network uh, to get lots of good advice from, from other sectors and, and, and other disciplines that comes to play. Uh, and I think probably, Christina, the last thing we kind of wanted to talk about, uh, as well as kind of what we're seeing with, with manufacturing for tomorrow, I mean, we're Looking at the moment, just last Christmas, we announced plans to build a hundred million pound factory for roll product manufacture for floating and fixed wind that can do everything from wind towers to suction buckets, transition pieces, and floating wind components. But the level of technology and investment we need to make in the machinery and the welding process to disrupt that uh, is, is really quite challenging. And the problem is you try and build a factory for today but you know, only yesterday we had eight and nine megawatt turbines. Today we've got 15 megawatt turbines. And I think I heard you right there, Christina, speaking about 25 megawatts coming down the path. How on earth do you build a factory today and get the investment to guess what the industry needs in five years time? Uh, you know, when you're writing off the equipment costs over 10, 15 years, you need some crystal ball to try and work out how you're going to future proof it. And that's a challenge. I think the, the final comment I would make, and then, uh, 
pass on to John is that the contracting nature and the commercial culture around renewables is very different. Some of the oil companies now play in both oil and gas and offshore wind. Some of the developers, uh, you know, Sub C7, Demi, Boscalis, they play in oil and gas and they're very uh, heavy in renewables. But the contracting cultures are quite different. The world of renewables is actually very competitive, very cutthroat. And that's not that the, these contractors have become nasty guys or nasty ladies. It's the fact that the whole financial pressures and time deliveries, the, the commercial risks involved in the big renewables projects are, are so much higher because of their scale and their serial nature. Uh, so you might be providing what you think is a similar service. You might be thinking that you're going to transition into renewables doing what you've always done, but for a new customer base. But the contracting philosophies, the commercial risks, the terms and conditions could be as polar opposites as north and south or east and west. And you really need to look at those very carefully and understand what you're getting into you might be deploying similar facilities and skills, whether that's in machining, manufacturing, assembly, but the terms and conditions you're doing it in may be dramatically different. And it's easy to think that you're dealing with a familiar product and with a familiar client base, but the T's and C's can be, can be dramatically different. Um, Christine, I hope I've covered kind of a, a broad spread there from innovation to competitiveness various things, but uh, keen to see what questions uh, come up in the Q&A session. But uh, everyone, thanks for listening. It's been a pleasure to be That's part great, of today. Steve. Thank you for your presentation. I completely agree. You cannot expect to apply the same knowledge from, from one client or one sector into another. Coming from aerospace, you know, order books seven years in advance. That gives lots of stability. And it incentivizes what you talked about, our, our differentiator around innovation and collaboration it's much more solid when you have uh, that stability and and the investment that you can put in with the assurance that you have a seven year worth of order books essentially um, so thank you for your thoughts and and your advice and uh, yes very very uh, very insightful. Uh, we now move on to our last presenter, and uh, John, John Rimmer, I will perhaps more in my comfort zone because it's around uh, blades manufacturing, but uh, John Rimmer started his career in the wind industry in 1995 and has been dedicated to the development of blades since 1998. Uh, he worked for Vestas for many years starting out as an engineer uh, with a particular interest in making blades easy to build. And he progressed through the ranks to lead uh, the whole of the rotor engineering department. Uh, he left the world of original equipment manufacturers in early 2020 to set up his consultancy business called DuraWind Limited with the aim of sharing his experience to others interested in uh, rotor blades and passionate about design for manufacturing. John is currently working with Act Blade Limited, which is one of the companies who's uh, incidentally working with, with a few of us uh, around, and he's helping them on their journey from technology to product on their Act 100 blade. Together with former colleagues, he has also set up another business, a DFM Blade Limited, which I believe stands for Defi Design for Manufacture Blade Limited, uh, to bring that design for manufacturing expertise to a wider customer base. Um, great to have you here, John, and uh, welcome. The, the floor is yours. Many thanks. Um, let me just share my screen. Lovely. Hi, um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you. Um, <clears throat> my uh, passion is about uh, how we can make blades easier to build, design for manufacture, how we can adjust the designs of blades so that they're more tolerant to the manufacturing process. Um, as I, as um, Christina said, many thanks for my intro. 
Um, I've been in Blades for a number of years, a couple of decades, and seen a lot of transitions there. And I think what's really important to understand is that um, what worked to get us where we are is not going to work to get us where we need to be. The Blades are profoundly different now to the technologies that they were when they first started out. And even if you only go back um, five or six years to looking at blades of you know, 50 meters long, weighing eight to 10 tons in factories that needed several hundreds of people to build these blades. Now we're looking at blades that are 100 meters plus, uh, 50 or 60 tons, and they need thousands of staff to build these, thousands of blade technicians to build these. So whenever you're changing products over, you have a lot of equipment you've got to change, but you've also got a lot of staff you have to retrain. And this really impacts the agility of the blade to be rolled into manufacturing and to produce money at the end of the day and deliver uh, energy to the offshore, um, offshore market. So this is what I'm gonna be talking about. <clears throat> so what's clear is that the, the days of wind turbines having a, a, a profitable life have of 10 years plus have completely gone. You know, we spoke early, we, we, in, in the earlier presentation, we heard that the cost of energy of offshore has come down from uh, 150 pounds to 39 pounds in the latest round. What that means is that it drives older turbines to be uncompetitive very quickly, which is, you know, kind of what we want. We want the industry to progress so that we are competitive and stay competitive. But what it does mean is the life of the product is reduced. So I've got an indicative graph here that shows that, you know, over the last 20, 25 years, you know, don't take the numbers as absolutes, it's indicative. You can see that the, the life of a turbine has reduced. And I've certainly been involved in some products that we've made that has a lifetime of six months maybe even a year at the most. And they just don't pay for themselves. They just don't pay for the investment that's gone in to delivering this, this product. So we've got these development times of a product, you know, from concept marketing through to design and then the ramp ups. These development times are getting reduced, but they're more dominated by the lifetime of the product not reducing. And, and in many cases, the development time is the same as the lifetime of the product. Now, what that means is that you have to catch all of that investment back because the development costs are so high. And you know, in these large offshore, offshore turbines, they run into many hundreds of millions of pounds. And if you don't get that money back, then all of that effort you've put in means the whole product is a loss at the end of the day. And that's quite easy to get to. You have to be really careful. So if you develop the wrong product, you stand to lose hundreds of millions of euros or, your, or pounds. And this is a really risky business. Um, so if we look at what a, where is the money in developing a product? So we have this design and this ramp up phase. This is all spend. This is all a, a, a loss in the business. This is all an investment. And it can take many years. It can take two or three years and you know, sometimes three or four years to develop a new product. Then we have the period where we're at full production. So we've gone through the development phase. We've gone through rolling into factories, ramping up the manufacturer, ramping up the global manufacturer, retraining the staff, buying new equipment, installing all of these, these, uh, this, this equipment in production. And then we're ramping that, we're running now at full production. We might only get two or three years of running at full production. And those sales pay for all of that investment of changing things over. Now imagine you're a factory manager and you've got a product that's running 
at that full production. And then all of a sudden, the bosses come and say, I need you to switch products, which means your factory now is going to be running at a loss for maybe a year while you're doing ramp up and retraining. It's hard work. It's hard work. And then the product dies it, and it has no more sales and you need to change it over because a more competitive product has been launched by a competitor and your product is no longer competitive. And this is the real world of blades and wind turbine products. And it's a result really of the competitive market and driving the levelized cost of energy down. And I don't know at what stage it's going to stabilize. I don't have a crystal ball, but it does definitely need to stabilize. And we need to start relying on products that come through. So the good, the bad and the ugly. Now, if we think about a business case when we get started on a product, that's the blue line. So whenever we go through our gate models or whatever, then we have these promises that we have to make that the product's going to deliver. And we're going to hit these ramp up times. Now, if we do better than that, or if we find technologies, more to the point, that enable us to do better than that, if we can reduce the product development time, if we can have faster product ramp up, then we get to sell the product earlier because the end date doesn't change. It's going to die at the same time because there's going to be other products that become more competitive. So if you don't sell the product within that brief window that you've got, you're not going to catch all your money back. So you need to think about how to develop products quicker and how to, more importantly, ramp them up in manufacturing. And this is where design for manufacture comes in. This is where thinking about standardization and modularization works. The, on the flip side, and the picture on the right is not unusual for products. It took longer than you thought to develop the product. The slower, the ramp up in production is slower than you think, but it still ends at the same time. And there are lots of products out there that have gone through this cycle. They've taken too long to develop, too slow in ramp up. They don't sell as many as much as they intended to sell. They don't make the income. And that whole product has been a loss. So if you think of the area between those curves, between the blue line and the green line, that's more sales, that's positive income. And between the blue line and the red line, that's less sales and negative income, potentially leading to a loss. So the rec we need to recognize that the saleable life is getting shorter. That has been a historic reality. And the key is delivering product, more product faster. So how do we do that? And how can the UK re redefine this product life cycle curve? The thing that we need to, re to do is to try and find ways of reusing the skills and reusing the equipment from product to product. Because if the staff, if the blade technicians are familiar with a particular process and it has subtle changes from product to product, then we are able to get rapid change and switch, switch processes over. So what I, the point that I'd like to make out of this is that it's too risky for the large OEMs to make these big steps because they're flat out on producing to the demand. And that demand is where they are making their money. So it's really difficult for them to be innovative and challenge their own systems. And this is where the OEMs need small and medium enterprises and they need startups who are prepared to take the risk, to do the thinking about how we can standardize the productions, how we can modularize the approaches, how we can, how we can move from a kind of craftsman approach to building blades where everything is all done by hand to a more assembly style approach. And that may involve automation, it may not involve automation, but we need to be moving on a sh shifting over to developing a more precise method of building blades that is switchable from product to product. And the OEMs need the SMEs and the startups to be developing these technologies and developing these approaches so that 
these reach a certain manufacturing readiness level and a certain technology readiness level that then, then can be introduced to the OEMs to adopt it. So the, the UK government is certainly providing funds for these SEMs and these startups. Um, but I must say, if we are serious as a nation, as the UK in becoming the manufacturing technology center for offshore blades, then it needs to be substantially more. We need to be raising the game to a much greater level. And we need to have these projects and the access to these funds to the SMEs and the, and the startups it needs to be more accessible and we need to be able to encourage the great skills that we've developed in the UK. There are lots of, lots of very, very capable people in the UK who can do this. Um, and as a parting note, we, we have got this fantastic opportunity here with all of this inward investment, with these massive plants being uh, built in Hull and uh, in Teesside, we need to move it to getting some intellectual property developed in the UK that looks after these manufacturing technologies. I will hand back to you now, Christina, thank you. Thank you, John, very, very useful and practical advice really on how we can, we can get there. Uh, that concludes our presentations from our panelists. I believe we have some questions. We have a few minutes for uh, Q and A's. Let me open uh, the floor. Uh, Sarah, John and Steve, if you'd like to turn your cameras on and I'll be directing the questions to all of you or depending on, on the subject to individuals. Um, we have a question here saying that uh, that number I said at the beginning, the five gigawatt per annum uh, troop uh, has been used several times this week and assumes production is smoothly loaded across a number of, of years from now until uh, the early 2030s. But in reality, um, it, it's not smooth, right? There are significant peak loads when you look at uh, commissioning dates. Uh, so the audience is asking, uh, so it's saying this accelerated deployment combined with accelerated and frequent technology development is squeezing margins and increasing risk for the supply chain. So the question is, how can industry and government help to provide more certainty in the supply chain? Uh, perhaps if I start with uh, yourself, John, who talked about uh, some of that, and then uh, invite uh, invite uh, comments from Steve and then Sarah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a very good point. I mean, clearly, if it's flatlined, then that's an easy thing to achieve, easier thing to achieve. It's not. It's a ramp up, clearly. So yeah, we're starting from. Uh, uh, a relatively low base at the moment, I think. And to get to those ambitions is gonna be a really big challenge. I think it's about how we develop our manufacturing technologies, talking about blades. Other people will be talking about the supply chain of materials for those blades, I'm sure. But for me, it's about how we can switch products over and how we can quickly grow our manufacturing plants and have manufacturing technologies that allow us to ramp up. You know, blades, large blades, 100 meter blades, it might take, it, it might take them two or three years before they reach their desired cycle time. That's just not good enough. They need to be hitting the cycle times within a few months the tack times um, so that they make money and that they can deliver the product. So it's shortening those times. Uh, Steve, would you like to add some comments to that? Yeah, so I think I, I, I chair the sort of our UK supply chain working group and I know that we've just kind of closed off as, as a sector and providing feedback to government on changes to the CFD process going forward and the supply chain plans. And I think one of the sort of key things out there is is a move to to yearly to yearly auctions of course there may be further you know changes to the cfd process but 
seeing things happen annually on a more kind of granular basis kind of helps take out some of those at least biannual your, your, your peaks and drops. That it's the fundamental problem though, and, and probably my view would be a bit different to John. I mean, all the analysis we've done for our own factory, albeit we're not making blades, but the trends seem similar, say that you're very unlikely to ramp up a major scale cereal production facility in under two years. So during that first two years, one year, certainly far from being at your most competitive, not at your most productive. So the industry, whether it's commitment from developers or, or commitment from OEMs, needs to make much earlier commitments to take capacity. We need to see the, the capacity reservation discussions going on much earlier than they're happening at the moment. And there's also a side discussion going on with government that when you talk about ramping up, and as John says, to be achieving the tack times that make you competitive and efficient, uh, the training, that's really on-the-job training, and all of the UK's current training budgets and training funding schemes are providing off-the-job training in colleges and universities and in recognised you know, training schools, not on the job. So there needs to be a bit of support. It shouldn't be thought of as subsidies, but there needs to be some on-the-job training support to get that ramp-up period compressed down to as short as possible time. And at the same time, a much earlier discussion and a much more collaborative discussion uh, from the industry about booking capacity much earlier than is currently happening. Uh, those are my thoughts. Thank you, Steve. And Sarah, would you like to, to give us some thoughts about how can industry and government help to provide more certainty in the supply chain? Yeah, I mean, everything's driven by the, the price. Everything's driven by CFD rounds and having them on an annual basis, yes, is 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 helpful, but we do believe, uh, from a supply chain pers perspective, that the that the methodology there needs to change to a more value driven approach. Uh, the price more is can only go so far before it becomes uh, quite damaging to the to the industry in general and the other thing is the fact that we can't incentivize or we can't mandate local content so that's that's another thing that can can only be driven by the government and the central services how can we loophole that how can we incentivize rather than mandate basically so how can we encourage the developers to really invest in within the UK supply chain. I completely agree, Sarah. It's more about incentive because mandate has a time limited stamp on it, where incentivation will bring that collaboration long term, where you no longer need to incentivize. It's already embedded in the system. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for for your inputs today. It's been a great session. I've personally learned a lot from from all of you. And uh, this brings us to an end of the session, not only of this session, uh, but also of the week, the Blades Week, where we've seen uh, five days of different discussions and presentations. And just on behalf of, of everybody, really, I'd like to thank um, all the various people who have been involved in this week. I'll start with the architect of the week, uh, which is our internal uh, catapult communications team, especially Vicky Sharp. Thank you so much for organizing the whole week, keeping us uh, straight and getting inputs from all these wonderful speakers. I'd like to also thank my fellow internal catapult colleagues who have, in some cases, chaired presentations, in some cases, uh, done keynotes and presented themselves on their on their programs. Thank you very much for uh, bringing exposure and, and sharing your knowledge with everybody. And uh, last but very important, the most important, I would like to thank all of our wonderful expert panelists across uh, the week. We've had uh, 12 to 15 people speaking, giving their insights and giving their time uh, for the audience. I also obviously want to thank the audience who have followed us uh, through the week. And what a wonderful week it has been. I've been able to join not all of the uh, 
the presentations. I've joined a couple and I've watched the YouTube videos for all of the others. Uh, so I would encourage you to do the same if you haven't or if you just want to recap on some topics, you can go to the YouTube channel uh, for the catapult and watch all the videos there online. Uh, so with that, I thank you very much and I conclude the Blades Week and I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye.